one. Thursday night edition of the Anaheim Calling Podcast. We're here to discuss some recent NHL news uh, concerning the NHL draft, which <laughs> invariably affects the Anaheim Ducks, who currently hold the fifth best odds at landing the number one pick. And then after that, we're going to get into some actual Ducks news, which, man, there have not been a lot of those in the last couple of months. Uh, some extensions for Christian Juice and Yanni Hockenpah. And we're going to we're gonna kind of go from there. So first and foremost, Jake, the NHL is trying to start playing hockey again. That is a very... Uh, a, a, a very drastic need right now. However, typically the NHL draft would be in the month of June. And with hockey and the season not having been concluded, the NHL is in a bit of a quagmire here. What do they do about the draft? Do they do it before they start the season back up? Do they do it after late in the year? Looks like we have an answer to that, at least to which way they, which direction they want to go in. So, Released earlier this week, the NHL's plans for an early June draft, which I believe would actually be earlier than even a normal draft, earlier in the month of June, and then after that would have the playoffs. So pretty unprecedented in, in recent memory to have a draft before the actual season itself has been concluded. So why don't we talk a little bit about this revamped draft model that they have proposed? Because it would have some pretty major ramifications across the board. So why don't you kind of just break it down here for us a little bit? Yeah. So kind of this was, and this is not set in stone. This is not completely for sure what they're going with. It's Nothing, a proposal. It, it is a proposal, but it is something that the NHL put out as an official memo. And so I think that is important that this is not pure speculation from a, a beat writer, from someone who's kind of in the know that has sources. This is, straight from uh the uh straight from the NHL. The NHL. So there <laughs> there this is kind of uh where they're going. So in the prior uh in the way the entry draft uh, lottery would have worked prior to this, the way that uh we've all speculated about the way it's worked the last couple of years, the top 3 spots are up for lottery. So when I say that, that means that number 1, number 2 and number 3 are all up for a lottery and it's ran first overall is uh picked from that it's ran again. The second overall is taken from that lottery and then ran again. The third overall is taken from that lottery. And then everyone kind of falls in line. And we saw last year, Chicago made a big jump up to number three from 12. And so basically any team in any position that is in the lottery. So any non playoff team could end up first, second or third. And this was done by the NHL. If you remember um, post the McDavid uh, draft, because it used to be that only the first pick was lottery. Number two and number three were not up for the lottery. And so the worst that the, uh, the best or the worst pick that the worst place team could get would be number two overall. The NHL was not a fan of the way that Buffalo went about tanking for McDavid. And so they implemented these rules. Now, the issue that you have going into this current draft is if they want to run it early, a lot of GMs have been uh, complaining or there's been complaining from fans about what if a team on the playoff bubble? Well, so up... what is the what is the actual proposal? Well, okay. So the actual proposal and the is that essentially only number one overall would be lottery. And it would be okay. similar to the way that it was previously. Mm. And included in that is that the most uh that you can move up in the lottery is five picks. So let's say in this uh this draft, if last year was this year, Chicago wins the draft lottery they end up as the 12th overall pick winning the draft lottery. The most that they can move up is five picks. So I believe that puts them at seventh overall, if my math is right. Uh, yeah, seventh overall is the, the highest that they can get. And then Detroit would still be first. Um, Otto would be second. San Jose third. LA fourth. Anaheim fifth. Um, mm -hmm. And then just everyone that kind of uh, that was jumped by Chicago would fall down in the draft. So kind of the biggest news from this is that the most that the Ducks can fall is to sixth place in the format that was supposed to go in, uh, supposed to be the format for the season. The Ducks would have fallen potentially to, I believe, eighth place is how far they could, far they could have fallen. So the Ducks will end up either with the first overall pick, fifth overall pick, or sixth overall pick. 
Their odds of getting first overall is are no different now than they were previously. It is one lottery. They have a 9% chance of getting first overall. The only difference now is they cannot get second or third. Right. So first off, how do you feel about this, this change? I'm good with it, honestly. I mean, you and I had talked about it in a previous podcast of how do you get the draft to happen? Because you and I had even said the draft is good for revenue. The draft is good for TV. There's no reason that they can't run the draft outside of potential trades. That is the only thing. Um, and then you also, uh, that and the impact of you could have potential playoff teams in the lottery. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of adds a wrench to that, that you don't know what the playoffs are going to be. I actually suggested just don't do a lottery this year. Just do it straight based on the, the points percentage. This mm -hmm. is kind of a little middle ground uh, between that, where you're cutting it off where a team on the bubble, if they do make the playoffs, um, the, and they win the draft lottery, the most they were able to move up was five picks. So yes, they're still getting a pretty good player, but it's not as if they're getting Alexi Lafreniere from it. And right. that's really what the NHL is trying to protect against. As a Ducks fan, I'm actually pretty thrilled with this because while yes, the odds were all right that they would move up into a top three, it was still only a 26% chance of them getting a top three pick. So they the Ducks previously had an 8.5% chance of getting first overall. And that is still the same. They had a 26% chance of getting a top three pick. Mm -hmm. If two teams were to jump the Ducks in the draft lottery. So let's say New Jersey and Buffalo, the two teams directly below the Ducks or above the Ducks in the standings, below the Ducks in the draft order. Um, if they were to have won the lottery, the Ducks could have moved down to seventh. Hell, they could have moved down to eighth. <laughs> um, so... Right. It, from a perspective of risk management, I'm good with this because there's potential for the ducks to get first. And that has not changed at all in that same breath. The ducks are pretty locked into fifth or sixth place. And so you kind of know and where you're picking and you and I have both really looked at the prospects, really gone through kind of done a bit of a deep dive. There's some really good YouTube channels out there that you and I have both watched that do, do about 15 to 20 minute videos, highlighting different strengths and weaknesses of these prospects. And in my personal opinion, the top seven, obviously Lafreniere's first, he's the biggest franchise altering player by field to clear second, but up until seven, I, in my opinion, you're going to get a really good player. So the fact that the ducks are, there's no way possible that they can drop to that eighth pick. I think that that is a big plus for this ducks team. <laughs> so that is absolutely the most math concentration I've had to have in the last two months all this statistical probability talk. So like you said, just to kind of sum it all up, basically this proposal still maintains the ducks shot at getting number one, which is unchanged and essentially guarantees that they're not going to bottom out from their, from their current st uh, spot in, in the, in the odds. So, so essentially right now, if it were just straight down the line, they would get the fifth pick. So the, there's no bottom falling out on them for that, which is good. So just so you know, TSN did a really interesting thing of looking at the percentages of finishing in different spots. Mm -hmm. um, the Ducks in the format that would have uh, happened this year had there not been the stoppage. Um, the Ducks, the biggest percentage would be for them to finish with the sixth pick. 35% of getting the sixth overall pick. 27% of getting the seventh overall pick. Um, only an 8% chance of getting the fifth. So they had a better chance of getting into the top three, one of the top three picks, than getting the yeah. fifth overall pick. Th that is a bit of the downside of this plan is that the Ducks are out of the running for any of those top three picks if they don't get first overall. Correct. And getting, and getting first overall is already a pretty slim chance. So but, that is the downside. But like you were saying, it, it guarantees that they're not going to just correct. fall into seven, eight, you know, wherever, wherever it may be, yeah, uh, exactly. wherever they can possibly land. So that's a good thing. And like you were just saying as well, with the depth of the top of this draft class, if you can at least stay in that five, top five, top six range, you're pretty, you're pretty set on getting a good player. So yeah, this, I, I would, I would call this an overall good set of news for the ducks. If it were to go through, um, I personally like it because I do think, as you said, that this is a bit of a middle ground where um, 
you know, I think what they're trying to do is lower the possibility that a team that may still make the playoffs, if we ever, you know, whenever that happens, to to get into that lottery. Uh, that's I think the idea of this, and I and I like that idea. I think that we clearly know that the teams who are, um, uh, you know, in that in that top range, Detroit, Ottawa, Ottawa again, LA, Anaheim, these are the teams that should be getting the, the shot at the, the top picks, and not a team like Columbus, Florida, Correct. the Rangers. Well, I, I think that I, I think I like this overall, even if it does seem like a bit of a departure or it is, it would be a departure from what we've seen in the, in the last few years, which is, Hey, uh, Chicago, who I think narrowly missed the playoffs last year. Uh, you can jump into the top three. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I, I mean the biggest winner, I mean, let's just kind of come out and say it. The biggest winner from this format is Detroit. Their odds of getting first overall change from 19% to 57%. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that's kind of the biggest winner out of all of this. Ottawa may be the biggest loser because they, although they are going to probably get the second and third overall pick or the third and fourth, they're still going to get really good picks. The mm-hmm. chance of them getting first and second and getting both Lafreniere and Byfield are basically gone. They, it's not yeah. possible unless whoever, if, unless they win the lottery and then second place passes on Byfield. Um, <laughs> But yeah. it, it Ottawa's kind of the loser of this format. Honestly, I kind of like this more than having it all be lottery. I like the only being able to move up yeah. five spots. But I think you can just I think just do the top three picks like this. Do the top three picks mm. lotteried. You can only move up five spots though. So the first over you do the lottery for the first pick, do the lottery for the second, do the lottery in the for the third overall pick. Similar type thing as yeah. previously, and it's this meshing where you're stopping the Chicago's of the world from winning the lottery and going up to the top when they exactly. don't necessarily need it. And I think that that is the yeah. biggest thing out of all of this. And so you're protecting the teams a little bit at the bottom, but you are still. I, Although are, let's let's be fair, these are bad teams being protected. It's not like well, they deserve any favors, but it does maintain the spirit exactly. of the draft. And yeah, that I agree with. Yeah. That, that's the the exact point of all of this is the it maintains the spirit of the draft whereas the NHL also wants to make it harder to tank so why not go three years or sorry yeah. three picks yeah exactly um so do, are you in favor of an early June draft because yes. there's been a lot of uproar uh, from the actual NHL community uh, scouts GMs not liking this idea uh, you know the possibility that <laughs> what was it that a playoff team gets like a top pick. Like and it. then wins the Stanley Cup, you know, which is impossibly low odds to happen. And in this format is not even possible. Yeah. Um, I'm with you, though. I, I'm totally in favor of it um, just because the NFL proved that it can be done and it can be done actually quite well. Uh, I, I'm not a guy who watches the NFL draft. I'm an NFL fan, but not a big NFL draft fan. And I watched the entire first round and, and it, it was it was well done, well produced. And there's no reason why the NHL can't do that either. It would be a ratings hit with all the sports right now being suspended. So why not do it? And I think that in this format, I think that the, what happened in the 70 ish games of the regular season would be preserved. And I think it would at least prevent the possibility that one of these teams who may still make a playoff run to, to really benefit from the draft being early. I think if you want to honestly avoid any and all speculation, any and all difficulty that comes up with that thought that the angel has, just don't do a lottery. Just do the draft, no lottery. Mm-hmm. Then you don't have that issue. It, yeah. you, it it locks. I mean, the NHL still wants to do a lottery because they want to somehow make it where Detroit potentially doesn't get first overall. Which is funny because if you're the NH, if you're like an NHL conspiracy theory person, wouldn't you want? Yeah. Detroit, wouldn't, wouldn't the NHL want Detroit to have the first overall pick right. to get it, get a star on an original well, six market? Yeah. The other down. So here's the only negative. And you and I had said, you and I on a previous podcast had said, just allow trades to happen and allow the players to play for those teams. Screw it. But there's yeah. no way that that's kind of a, a pie in the sky type of thing. I there's am, no way the I, NHL would do that. Oh no. Yeah. And, and it would never get past the yeah. board of governors or, no. but I am just, at this point, you know, I have abandoned everything I said a couple months ago where things need to be preserved, and I'm just team chaos now. I'm just team chaos. I don't care. Give me the sports. I don't care what package it comes in, whether trades happen, and then the trades that happen on draft night carry over into the playoffs. doesn't matter. Well, just 
Just go the, crazy, NHL. <laughs> the other thing is, and this is the key thing for the NHL, is they're going to get revenue from TV, and I guarantee you they're getting pressure from Sportsnet to give them some sort of content. And so yeah. this is easy content. This is easy television viewing, easy thing to hype up. No, there aren't the trades, but yeah, it, and it gets, it, it, it gets yeah. every team in the NHL to pay attention because every team wants to care about the future. Every team wants to look at the future of their team. Um, the only other thing is what do you do about conditional picks with if you make the playoffs and how far you go and everything along it's those really, lines. It's really tough, too, with the salary cap not being officially set for next year. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, a which is actually a theme that's going to come up later on. But yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of complications there. But so if you don't want to deal with any of that, just have the draft with no trades. Yeah, and, exactly. And that, and that and that will be plenty. We don't need draft night trades. That that is an awesome sweetener that we have gotten in in this cap era. But it's not necessary to enjoy the draft no, and, not and a, see where these players go. Not at all. And I think it gives uh, fans of teams like Ducks fans um, a glimmer of hope, something to care about, something to pay attention to. And also from a purely selfish uh, perspective, it gives us something to talk about. Yeah, I mean it's it's just a win uh, across the whole board. Yeah. Um, so, so just to oh go ahead. I was just gonna say I'm a big fan of it. You know, give us as much content as you can. Give us anything new. And here's the other thing, and this is kind of a big thing for me on this is what difference does it make draft wise? Well, that's the other thing between we're drafting ta- in June about... and, and drafting in October. You're not gonna see more oh, yeah. of these players. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I, I think it's mostly the, the the fact that the regular season hasn't concluded yet, and that the playoffs haven't happened. Um, um, by but by the t- teams should just be confident in their scouting and not worry so much about the outcome of a short tournament. <laughs> yeah. By the way, Varluna asked. So does it? And I think that this is a good point to summarize it all. She's like, so does that mean the Ducks will pick one, five, or six, and I guess thirty-one from Boston? So yes, if this all goes through, the Ducks would pick either first, fifth, or sixth. Um, mm-hmm. That's locked in under this format. And then Boston, yeah, under points percentage, if they ran the draft, the Ducks would also have the 31st overall pick uh, due to Boston having the best uh, points percentage in the league. Yeah, so I guess just to kind of wrap this thing up, at least this topic, um, are you in favor of an expanded playoff format as opposed to like a abridged regular season before yes. the playoffs begin. Yes. Uh, I know there was talk today. So about, you, so you, so you favor the expanded playoffs. I, I favor the expanded playoffs over uh, an abridged regular, uh, finish off the regular season and play a traditional 16 team playoff. The reason for that is Detroit's already eliminated. There's no way they're going to make the playoffs <laughs> for all intents and purposes. The ducks are eliminated also. If they do, were to do, do Red Wings fans really want to see that team play again? Well, and anyway, <laughs> the only reason why as a Ducks fan, you want to see the Ducks play more is first off, you're bored and you just want to watch hockey, but you can watch any team, but mm-hmm. you want to see Trevor Zegras. That is something that would be exciting to watch for the Ducks. But, um, I, I think as a Ducks fan, I would more so, this is just me personally talking, um, would want to see them just shut it down. Don't risk these guys. These guys are going to come back. They're going to have well, so to get by themselves... expanded playoffs. We're talking about more teams being in than 16. Yes. 20 teams, 24 teams, something mm-hmm. along those lines where as the regular season, you have teams that are out of it, potentially putting guys in places to get hurt. The mm-hmm. uh, Detroit Red Wings. Why do you want to play 10 more games for guys, guys to put in two weeks of effort to then just play meaningless games for three weeks yeah. and potentially and risk your body. Get- games that aren't going to actually bring revenue to the team from the arena and games that could potentially put them at risk health wise. Yeah. So there, and- there's not a lot of benefit, but I do agree that as opposed to having a regular season, let those fringe teams that were kind of on the bubble, just give them, give them a playoff and- spot. And, and I mean, it's going to sort itself out. The, the Florida Panthers are not, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I could end up being wrong, but like the Florida Panthers aren't getting past the Bruins or the lightning or, or whatever. So it doesn't, I don't think it's going to matter in the end anyway. Well, the only thing that I will say is having kind of just gone through that uh, little breakdown of kind of not wanting guys to come back to potentially get hurt. I mean, it may be even worse in that playoff format where if you do a one, I mean, the thing that I've always thought about is you go to a 20 team format, 
Mm-hmm. And so there are there are basically four teams on the bubble, two in the West, two in the East. And so yeah. you just include those and you add two more wild cards. You do a wild card round of single game uh, elimination. Um, but then you have guys coming back, getting into shape for a single game, which is a bit well, unfair. I but... do think though that those teams on the bubble have earned like a final shot at it. They've earned, yes. they've earned some finality well, to their season. And it's a game that matters. And it's a game that matters. And there's, they'll do they'll do training camps, you know, they'll find a way to get ready. Yeah. And maybe make it like a best of 3, maybe not one game just to have that rest game and then have the the next two. Um something like that. I mean, I'm 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 fine with that. Again, yeah. this is all so speculative because well, it's not purely speculative because the league is talking about this and that, like this is going to happen at some point. Um it's just it's kind of further down in the into the future also, right now. Varluna points out in terms of kind of the Ducks feeling like the season is over. Uh, Varluna mentions that Bob or asking, didn't uh, Bob Murray start doing exit interviews for some of the players anyways? Yes. I believe that Bob Murray has started his exit interview process. So Bob Murray is essentially treating this like the season is over and going through the process of doing exit interviews with all of his players. So I'm of the opinion, cancel the regular season, run the playoffs, run the playoffs whenever you feel like it's safe to do it, do it empty arenas, do it at neutral sites, Give us something to watch. I mean, we're starting to see that leagues um, throughout the world are starting to come back. You have Korean baseball has been uh, all the buzz because that is really the for- first uh, sporting league to come back. Uh, the Bundesliga was just announced to come back with the first game, I believe, being a week from Saturday. So we're starting to see sports in different countries that are coming yeah. out of this a bit quicker than the U.S. has. Well, um, even in even in the U.S., you have UFC and WWE true. that are that are. <laughs> putting on events. I mean, to be fair, like for example, South Korea is so ahead of everyone in terms of their health situation that for them, it's not, it's not really a fair example, but it does show that, Hey, like this is, we're going to get to a point where we can at least start having some very kind of secluded quarantined off games happening. Okay. Speaking of Bob Murray and his off season, definitely ramped it back up yesterday announced that Yanni Hockenpah and Christian Juice both extended one-year extensions. So let's go player by player here. Um, we'll start with Yanni Hockenpah. I think this will be a little quicker. Um, t- uh, accepted a one-year $750,000 extension, which is a $150,000 um, reduction from his previous contract that he signed with the Ducks. He's going to be 28 going into next season, right-handed D, um, in 77 minutes with the Ducks this past year, uh, was just below break even, 47.5 in shot share and 46% in expected goals. So basically, when he was out there, the Ducks weren't really getting the better of the chances or anything like that, but they weren't getting slaughtered either. And he was actually a slight positive relative to his teammates in in those uh, aspects of the game. And he's not overly physical at six five, but he's I think he showed that he got a little better towards the end of the season, got a little more comfortable. Yeah. Um, he started so to understand you... North American ice, I think, probably a little bit more. I think his time in yeah. San Diego probably helped with that. He he was solid. He wasn't great. He wasn't absolutely horrible trash. Um, he, he was so better. So he wasn't Corbin and Holzer. Uh, you beat me to the punchline. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think he was better than Holzer was for the Ducks. And so this just really feels like a depth signing, obviously. He may get a couple games with the uh with the Ducks. He may get um he may get some games or majority of the games with the goals. Um it's a situation that it it's kind of going to be up and down. This is a one-way deal, which is of note, which means he gets paid the same amount in the NHL as he does the AHL, but his prior contract was also a one-way deal. So, um part of this might be because the in terms of him taking less money, it might be because of the the fact that uh he played so much in San Diego so they didn't want to have to pay him as much if he's going to be with the goals it also could just be uh or because of the economy um with everything that's been going on the salary cap is more than likely in flux people don't know exactly what's going to happen with it moving forward so this may be him trying to get some job security and being willing to take a little bit less money to get that security for next season set in stone before you hit the off season everything kind of gets set so that is one possible explanation. And I think it had to have played a part in at least the conversations they had. Um, 
I guess just to kind of include Juice into this conversation, he also took a pay cut, went from 1.25 million to 1 million. So both salaries went down for the next year. Here's the thing though. Did either of these players do anything to at the to even increase their salaries or or maintain where they were previously? I mean, they they barely played. Yeah. Juice Juice was an outcast from Washington, found a found a nice little niche in Anaheim. Hockenpah was signed as a UFA from Finland and was in the minors the entire year. So on one hand, you could say, yes, these there is a very real possibility that the reductions in contract are due to the cap situation, due to the economy, which, you know, those two things are obviously tied together. But on one hand, I just don't think either of these guys really did anything to increase their lot financially. No, but I mean... Like, like, like with, like, with Hawk and Paw, at least what was Hawk and Paw? What does Hawk and Paw sign for in normal circumstances? Probably, eight, probably the same 850k. It would be the absolute. I mean, there's just no way it would be higher. Is, no. is the point I'm trying to it, make? It's probably exactly what he would get. I would say Juice. You could probably make the argument that he would get 1.25. I, I think both would probably be about stable. We're uh, we're talking about not a huge decrease here, and it, I think that it makes more sense that it's due to the cap situation and everything that's going on. Yeah, um, I mean, that's that's fair. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so for just to kind of put a bow in Hawk and Paw, so, I mean, I think he's he could be, you know, like a seventh D-man for Anaheim next year yeah. because they are going to need they are going to need someone that's a right-handed shot, at least we think, for that third pairing. So it's not a... It's definitely not a terrible signing at all. Well, also, someone I was listening to, I believe, yeah, it was the Steve Dangle podcast, and they mentioned this, that no one has any idea what next season's going to look like. If it's it, – it sounds like they want it to be an 82-game season. That that seems to be the route that they're taking. They also seem to want to have fans in the arena for next season. So that means it may be delayed until December or something along there for next season. With that being said, they in order to get 82 games starting in December and wanting to end in July-ish, you're going to have a very concentrated season where you may have, and this happened uh, for a couple games during the lockout short year when you had to do condensed games to hit the 48 game mark, you would have three games in three nights. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, the AHL does it. So I would not be shocked, though, if that's the way that they, they go for next season. And as part of that, you need to have added depth. And you need to have guys that can step in and play and contribute and not be horrible. And so I think Hawk and Paw kind of fits that role because when you're playing three games in three nights, you may have have better players, but they may just need a rest. Yeah. So yeah, no, that's actually that's actually a really good point. You, the depth is going to be a lot more important next year just to get through the season. Yeah. Uh, never mind win games. Um, moving on to Christian Juice here, we talked about a salary already. Just to uh recap that so one year one million slight decrease from his 1.25 he's going to be 26 in august so you know he's not really a young player anymore but he's still kind of firmly in that productive prime at least he is a left-handed d put up some really good numbers with the ducks Um, i mean i was blown away by how much he impressed with his play just from an eye test perspective just so comfortable with the puck um in the offensive zone a good puck mover but it all translated into great stats. I mean, it, he played almost 140 minutes at five on five, controlled 53, sorry, 52% of the shot attempts and 53% of the expected goals. So relative to his teammates for expected goals, that was plus 11%. And for the shot attempts, that was plus 6%. So he was not just good on his own, but he was also very good compared to the rest of the team. Yeah. And he was averaging 21 minutes and 22 seconds a night. So he was playing pretty serious minutes under Dallas Aiken. So it's, it's of course, a very limited sample. But you have to at least, and this is what the Ducks did, you have to at least see if he can do it again. And so I think that he can be a very solid third-pairing defenseman for the Ducks next year. Yeah, I definitely could see him. I mean, his numbers, like you said, were fantastic, but granted, the the biggest thing is it was over a nine game sample, so you'd want to see that uh, hold up a little bit longer. But he was very good over that period, and so it's one of those things where it's going to be nice to see what he can do over a longer period. The only concern I have, and this is just an overall concern with the Ducks' defense, is the fact that he's left handed and plays the left side. 
So mm-hmm. what are the Ducks going to do with the fact that their entire defense is almost left-handed and majority of them want to play the left side? The other thing on him to note is, yes, he did take a pay cut. The way I view this contract is kind of a show-me type deal. He is still a restricted free agent at the end of this deal. Um, I believe not at the end of this contract, but at the end of the one that would be coming afterwards, he'll be a UFA. Um, so basically this is, uh, this contract ends, he'll be a restricted free agent and that will be his last summer of being a restricted free agent. So he's going to try to cash in after this one is what my gut tells me. So this is the ducks trying to get at least one season out of him at a cheaper rate before if he's able to prove it, they pay him more. Right. Yeah. It's a, I think it's a good deal for both sides because yeah. Ju- juice isn't locked into anything where his value is probably at his lowest Yep. at its lowest. And then for the ducks, you know, they're not, they're getting a chance to kind of see if he can, if he can extend out that sample size. And, you know, he doesn't have to be this good over a long stretch. He just has to be decent. I mean, the ducks, we've talked about this so many times, the ducks third pairing in the last really two years has not been good. It's been a a very significant weakness for this team. So juice did a long, did a heck of a job to try to rectify that. And I think, I don't think there's any, there's, I'm very confident that he's going to be able to keep this up. Just everything that we saw in his game, um, hopefully for him, it, it turns into a big payday. But you talked about it, and I mean, this is the elephant in the room, and this is kind of like the the big topic we're going to end or end the show on before we get into the questions, if we can get any. Um, how do you fix the Ducks blue line overload? I mean, that's that's the major issue. The Ducks locked in a couple pieces for the foreseeable future, but here are the defensemen right now that are under contract for next season. And this is the probable lineup when they're going to be healthy. You have Cam Fowler, Eric Branson, Hampus Lindholm, Josh Manson, Christian Juice, Yanni Hockenpah. And then after that top six, you've got Jacob Larson, Josh Mahara, and Brendan Gooley. And so, Fowler, Lindholm, Juice, Larson, Mahura, Gooley are all lefties. Seven left-handed D. And w- with Larson, I mean, I know that they still see him as as part of their uh, as part of their NHL team because he's he was a fixture in the lineup under Dallas Akins. Josh Mahura at some point is going to need a shot. Brendan Gooley was acquired in exchange for Brandon Montour, who was once one of this franchise's most prized prospects. So clearly they want to see him take a step forward. So you have a lot of guys in this mix. Um, but how many of these guys actually track as key pieces moving forward? You know, Gooley didn't impress last year. Um, Mahura is promising, but there's a log jam. Larson, you know, they have shown faith in him, but how long is that going to last? Eric Goodbranson has only one year left. Mm -hmm. So the core really seems to be Cam Fowler, Hampus Lindholm, and Josh Manson. And then after that, everything is interchangeable. And who even knows if Manson will still be here? We've speculated that maybe, or there's been some talk of his name being in the trade rumors. We've obviously speculated on it a lot. We've also speculated on Lindholm and Fowler. It it would make sense to trade Josh. It would make sense. But at the same time, they have such little actual depth and actual needle movers. We, we and, and and you have to have some. I mean, there's an argument that you need to have some level of competency on the blue line. Agreed. I it almost feels like something has to happen in the quote unquote off season whenever that happens. There have to be moves to be made to to shore up this defense. The thing that gives me trouble is that we said the same thing last summer. Yeah, and, and it's only and it and it's only gotten more true. There there are now more cooks in the kitchen. Yes. And so um, it, it's even more confusing. I think the the first and easiest solution to the problem on the right hand side is if the Ducks uh take Jamie Drysdale in the draft <laughs> because he potentially could step right into the Ducks lineup, um, having watched some of his highlight videos and what he can do and instantly would jump on that right-hand side and give you the Ducks could, a little you, bit more You think depth. he could hang with uh, Larson and Hockenpah? Oh, and, maybe, maybe, and, just and maybe. Brennan Gooley? You, you would think, you would think. <laughs> but uh, that's kind of the, the quickest and easiest solution, but there's going to have to be some work on this blue line. Bob Murray has a big, big task at hand to shore up this blue line to make it work because, to me, you got to move out something. You need to take out something from this blue line to be able to get something to help it moving forward. And by that, I mean move out one of the guys who are in their prime age 
because this Ducks team needs to start moving out some of those prime age guys for younger guys. And so whether that is moving a Josh Manson for a younger type of player who can play the right side, that also would work. You just need to make this blue line younger because they're all prime age. I mean, even Christian Juice, we, we, you mentioned Well, even Hampus Lindholm. <laughs> well, yeah, but my point is people think Juice is young because they traded for him and he's uh, kind of considered almost like a prospect in a way. But he's going to be turning 26 in August, and so he's going to be starting this season at 26. So that would mean that Lindholm, Fowler, Manson are all going to be in the 26 to 29 range for this upcoming season. Those are your prime years. And so if the Ducks aren't contending this year, what's the point of having those prime age players this season? Why not? I And yeah. there, there, there is a benefit to having some of them. You don't want the team to be completely awful. You want them to be able to be competitive, but you also need to be planning for the future that so that when you're contending, you have those prime age players. And so that is the argument for moving out one of those guys. And I don't foresee them moving out juice because first off, his trade value is not probably great, and he just was re-signed. So, to me, you need to take a look at moving one of Fowler, Lindholm, and Manson. And you can pick whoever you want it to be. I have my opinion, and I've made that fairly clear on who I think that the Ducks should probably trade out of that group. Um, but you need to make this blue line younger. because Well, they do frank- have the option of trading Erica Branson since he will be a pending UFA next season. That is true, and I think he probably upped his value a little bit this past year. Yeah, I mean, his value always actually seems decent. <laughs> well, because he's except for when traded. the Ducks got him. The Ducks got him for nothing. Well, the Ducks don't really have this great track record of assessing value and True. striking while the iron's hot. But yeah, I mean, the point is, though, they don't necessarily have to tap into that main core to at least kind of shuffle the deck chairs. But I think that all of that, it doesn't seem like a great solution because the Ducks don't want to tear it down. They just don't want to do that. There's nothing that they have done so far that indicates that they're going to go down that rabbit hole. So in theory, we both agree that you're probably better off trading some of those guys and moving the clock back. But if we're dealing in reality, that's not what they're going to do. Nothing again in their track record indicates that unless they change GMs and the Samuelis get sold on a GM who's you know, proposing a three-year, re, you know, a true rebuild for three years. But the way the economy is going, the way that, um, you know, teams' revenues and smaller markets are being impacted, I don't think the Ducks are going to have an appetite to go to a teardown. So true. that scenario that scenario seems almost impossible at this point. Fair. So you, so you, have, to, you have to find other ways. Um, and there's a couple things that I think you can do. Um, we've heard okay. Adam, we've heard Adam Henrique's name floated out a lot in terms of, uh, p- possible trades from the ducks. I think he's probably, again, the guy that makes the most sense to where you can extract him from the forward group. The forward group doesn't get a ton worse. You're trading him at his peak value, put up 25 goals. Um, this past season, the contract isn't great, but you are trading him at a, at a good value point. And I think you could at least get some kind of decent, yeah. younger defenseman for him or and this is what i have in my notes in all caps draft jamie drysdale <laughs> just fix the problem well we just boom problem solved let's finish this up but i do uh after we we finish this up i do want to talk about the potential prospects the ducks could take in those five and six picks and i think that's important jamie drysdale though you and just I have Jamie been Drysdale. J- just fix the problem. You and I have been skeptical of Jamie Drysdale because of the fact that he's the highest rated defenseman. And so there's potential for the, him to get a bit overhyped and overrated because of that. Yeah, I have I have turned around fully on that. He, he looks like he's going to be a very, he very is, good player. He is worth he is worth the hype. I don't think I mean, obviously, the fact that he's the only really highly, highly skilled defenseman helps his stock. The drop off after Drysdale is pretty severe. From not saying defenseman. those guys beneath, yeah. not saying those guys beneath him are bad, but the up the the ceiling gets a lot lower after him. And but he but even if yeah. you remove that, he is a very very good defenseman. His skating is so elite, and I think that if you put him on that Ducks blue line and you factor in the forwards that they already have, and who knows who they pick up maybe again after another draft, they could be pretty set. Um, right. Yeah. But it's not it's not the impact kind of 
move the needle type forward that maybe we've talked about a lot, but he's very good. He would not be a bad selection for this team. No. And it's funny. You and I both have watched that video or a couple of videos on him. I had mentioned that his skating is elite and it's funny comparing him to Fowler. And you made the good point though, that his skating is so much more dynamic than Fowler. Fowler is very smooth, very good on his edges. Jamie Drysdale, especially going backwards is just dynamic. Well, he's very fast. He's got yeah. a lot of speed as well. Yeah. Um, and, and his, his ability to maneuver in the offensive zone is just really remarkable for a defenseman. He just seems to have all of the, all of the factors you want in a top defenseman, the skating ability, the hockey sense, the, the defensive responsibility. He's, I mean, I don't see how he doesn't go straight to the NHL from junior. I don't know what he would have left to do in junior. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, that would be my, that would be my, if you're purely looking at solving this situation, I think the easiest one draft position permitting is to draft Jamie Drysdale. So one thing I do want to mention, you mentioned this with moving Adam Henrique. The other thing with moving a, uh, a Lindholm, a Manson or a Fowler is although yes, it is not likely to move one of them because of the fact that the Ducks are going to want to be competitive to get people in the building. There's also the the aspect of this of trying to clear out money. The Ducks might want to move money out in this situation where the income is not going to be as high. There's might be guys that get kind of traded out that get there may be a compliance buyout. There may be things like that to be able to kind of shed some money from the salary cap um, to help some teams out. So we may see Manson or Lindholm or Fowler kind of go by the wade side just because of that because they're trying to clear out money and they yeah. may be viewed as expendable in that sense. Adam Henrique, to me, I think is one of the most expendable players from that perspective, not saying he's bad. It's just more the perspective of he's actually been very good this year and can get you something in return and also clears out that money. And he's in his prime age years. So yeah. Um, going back, though, to the players that the Ducks could draft, I mean, why don't you give me your list of kind of the top seven players in this draft. <laughs> so do you want to go through this by if they get the first, fifth or sixth pick? Well, if they get the first pick, they're taking Lafreniere. <laughs> Are you sure about that? Are you yeah, sure about that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So the consensus and, number one pick for the last <laughs> yeah, two years. Exactly. And at five um, or and at five or six, they can uh they're not gonna be able to take Byfield. I'm pretty positive that Byfield for is probably gonna go second overall. Yeah, so let's just kind of game this out. So let's say that right now the Ducks, let's let's go with just the, the kind of strict. Do you want to just do the strict kind of current odds right now? Sure. In terms of where they're... Because in, because in this scenario, in just the, just the current draft standings, the Ducks have the fifth pick anyway. So okay. let's just do a mock draft here with the okay. way things are currently set. Okay. So we get an Ottawa back-to-back. Are you are you okay with this format, or yes. do you want to now, do a now, different format? Now I get what you're saying. Yes, I okay. am. I am okay with this format. So first overall, the Detroit Red Wings select Alexi Lafreniere. I don't see them going with Byfield. No. Lafreniere is the most guaranteed value. He may not have the absolute highest ceiling of recent first round picks, first overall picks, but you know he's just been the consensus for so long now that I feel like we've hit the point where people are picking him apart a little bit, which is probably actually a good sign for him because he's just so obviously better than everyone else. Yep. Number two overall, the Ottawa Senators with the first of their back-to-back picks. Who do they select at number Uh, two overall? They definitely take Quinton Byfield. Um, It just makes sense for them to take him. It gets him a franchise center, essentially the the next – I mean, people are comparing him to Evgeny Malkin. So that gets them their, their next franchise center to go with all the other players. Yeah, I think that that's, it's very unlikely that Byfield doesn't go number two. There was some, I mean, you know, it's Twitter, it's quarantine. People are just looking for things to talk about. So let's not, let's not go too crazy there. But there was some chatter that maybe Stutzel will go number two because teams really like him. Um, but that just feels so infinitely unlikely Ottawa will go with Byfield. He makes so much sense just for their team. And there's a very legitimate case that he's the second best prospect in this draft anyway. Um, okay. 
at number three, the San Jose Shark. Just kidding. The Ottawa Senators again from due to the Eric Carlson trade. I think they take Jamie Drysdale with this pick. Um, that would give them a franchise center and a franchise defenseman. You don't think they go forwards back to back? No, I think that they want, especially with how Drysdale is projected, how good he is. This gets them. Uh, and it's a like, good it's it's a good sell to the fan base too. Yep, you pick up a player at two very distinct positions, uh, center and defense, two very important positions. So to me, Drysdale goes probably three to Ottawa. Interesting. I could see them going with maybe one of the Swedish forwards, Lucas yep. Raymond or um, Alexander Holtz, but. I mean, I don't, I don't disagree that Trisdale would be a good pick for do them. Do they look at making a reach and getting a Marco Rossi? He's a guy that is playing is in he, their backyard. Is he a reach? I mean, he's playing in their backyard. He's uh, playing for the Ottawa 67s, right? He would be a popular pick in, in the, within the fan base, but I think that fans would probably be more excited if they got Trisdale over yes. Rossi. Yep. Um, but that is a player in their own backyard. They probably have scouted him as much or more than a whole lot of other people. So, uh, kind of mm-hmm. to summarize, first overall is uh, Lafreniere, second overall Byfield. Do we agree that third overall would be Drysdale? I think it's I think it's the the the, the best case right now. It's the most probable. Mm-hmm. Okay. It, it it's the easiest to understand. Okay, now all bets are off. Now <laughs> now, just... now it's anyone's game. That that's why I like Drysdale going three because that makes these next few picks way harder. Um, Los Angeles Kings. At number four, who do you have them selecting? Um, or do you want me to pick for the Kings so yes. that way you can pick for the yes. Ducks? Yes. Since y- you yes. are the Ducks fan yes. here. Yes, you, you go ahead and pick for them. <laughs> this is brutal. I don't know who I would pick it for if I were them. But as the acting GM of the Los Angeles Kings, don't you I take look him. at my, Don't you take I, him. I look at my Don't team, you do it. I look at this roster. Don't you do it. And I think to myself, what don't does do it, it lack? Don't do it. J- Jamie Drysdale's off the board. So the guy that could fix our aging Yaroslav de- Askarov deteriorating blue line, uh, drafting a, a goalie this high just doesn't make sense with the, it's just so <laughs> many uh, guys who have busted. Jake, Jake Sanderson's there as a defenseman. If you want him, we need dynamic offensive playmaking ability. We are selecting from Mannheim. Ah, in the you DL, Tim Stutzle. Ugh, I think it I, hadn't I think even I did that popped right. into my head that he could be a king. That well, actually hurts. If, if so, here's what I will say: If Ottawa goes two forwards, I could see Drysdale very easily going to LA because yeah. they they could really benefit from him. So, Jake Rudolph, newly minted, well, general manager of the Anaheim Ducks, you're on the clock. Oh, this is tough. This is very tough. I think. I think I would probably have to go with Alexander Holtz in this position. Uh, Interesting. The, o- the only thing I don't love about it is taking a guy on as a winger, but to me, he has. I don't also. I also don't love drafting for need as compared to drafting best available. But I think well, that this Marco is, Rossi is a center. I think this is a Let's bit of a mix out. where Alexander Holtz has one of the best shots in this entire draft. He's one of the best players. You already have the guy in your system in Trevor Zegras, who's going to be setting up goals for a lot of people. You've now al- added Alexander Holtz to the system, who is a guy that has never seen a shot that he didn't like. He will shoot the puck from anywhere, and he has a lethal shot to go with it. So I could see them taking Alexander Holtz. Here's the thing, though. At five or six... It's see, I don't any- like... I could see them... you got to make the pick. You they take it fine. They take Alexander Holtz. Okay. But I think... In order to inform people on this podcast, Felix, and he's Swedish. In order to inform people on this podcast, the other options that the Ducks could take at this position would be Lucas Raymond. So, just a, a quick little breakdown of every player. Alexi Lafreniere is the most dynamic player in this draft, without a doubt. He's going to be first overall. He's going to be a franchise player. Quinton Byfield is a guy that, although he has not put up the best numbers uh, in, in terms of junior scoring for, uh, draft eligible players, he is significant, significantly younger than everyone else and has done it on a pretty, on a Sudbury team that is not the best in the world. And so that's why he's gotten that type of hype. And he's six, four. Yes. And Tim, so. Tim, uh, Tim Stutzle has been playing for Adler Mannheim in the German league, which is kind of an underrated league at this point that has been producing some solid players. Mort Sider obviously went high last year. And there are a couple guys this year uh, from that league that could go that uh, in the first round. 
Um, but he's a very dynamic player. Anytime you watch him, to me, he's the most dynamic player in this draft outside of Alexi Lafreniere. He's the most exciting. He's the most highlight reel. And that's why, personally, I would love the Ducks to take him. Jamie's Drysdale, like we've already talked about as defenseman. Um, Alexander Holtz, to me, the best shot of this draft. Um, and so that's kind of why I could see the Ducks taking him at five if he's there. Cole Perfetti is a defenseman playing for Saginaw. I watched oh, you a mean little... forward? What did I say, defenseman? Yeah. I meant center. Um, <laughs> okay. There we go. Center for Saginaw. You, uh, I honestly have not watched a whole lot. Very skilled forward. Cole Perfetti, but he is very skilled. Um, could potentially play on the wing also. Um, Marco Rossi. Why don't you give a, a, a It's little... actually funny how Marco Rossi just gets no respect. Where, in, in in this like what's your opinion because yeah, you are someone podcast. that's you are someone that's very high on him so marco rossi let's just let's just start with the criticism so i can obliterate it after um the criticism of marco rossi is that he is on the older end of the spectrum for draft eligible players this year he's going to turn 19 if if this weren't a normal year he would be 19 before the regular season even starts so he is a bit of an older prospect, and the reason why that matters, the reason why people uh, believe that to be a knock is because um, if you're dominating but you're older in a junior league, how much does that say about you and how much does that say about the league and the fact that you're just beating up on guys who have less experience than you? So that's why— There's one other knock also. The other knock is he's on a very dominant team in Ottawa. He's on a very good team. And how much of that is him and how much of it is him playing with a guy like Jack Quinn? You it's you can't he, really he, separate them two, so both of them, so it's kind of hard to make that distinction. Yeah. But I just I don't know. I think he's been good enough, more than good enough to show that it's okay like those things shouldn't prevent you from being high on him. I mean if you go to his first season with the 67s, put up 65 points in 53 games, which is very respectable in those playoffs. So this was his, the year before his draft year, put up 22 points in 17 games, was pretty productive in the Swiss Junior League, which doesn't have this big track record, but he compares well to other good Swiss players who have come out and have been top draft picks like Nico Hischier, Timo Meyer. And this year just torched the OHL. I mean, 120 points in 56 games. And every his entire style of play, it translates so well to the NHL. Just physically mature, defensively, defensively responsible, very intelligent with the puck, has a really good shot. He might not have the highest ceiling. I'm perfectly okay with saying that, but I think that he his floor is pretty high. I think that he's going to be a top six center in the NHL. I think that he's going to be that good. And if you're a team like L.A., where you're drafting number four, maybe you value that because you want, you see yourself as getting back into the playoffs instead of just going full teardown sooner rather than later. And maybe bringing in a guy like Rossi who can make that jump sooner is more valuable than a guy like Stutzle mm -hmm. who maybe is a bit more of a project or maybe a year or two away. So yeah. I am, I'm just high on Rossi because I think he's just a lock to be a very good NHL player. And that... Maybe that's overconfident, but I think that there's a lot of value for that as a as a top 10 draft pick. Yep. And then the final person kind of in this group that I consider to be the kind of elite group of this draft is Lucas Raymond, who yep. the, the issue with him is he really struggled to get playing time this past year in the um, in the Swedish league. And so that's really kind of been a bit of a knock on him is there just hasn't been a whole lot of game time for him this past year, whereas a guy like uh, Alexander Holtz for Deer Garden was able to get a lot of playing time in the the uh, top of the Swedish league and so was able to find that playing time and succeed in it, whereas Raymond, when he did play, struggled. And so I think that's the biggest difference between him. Why I have Holtz a little bit higher is well, that Holtz success. Is, Holtz is just more of also just like an, you watch them play and he's just more of a natural goal scorer type. Oh, you know, yeah. The, the, the physicality, the shot, uh, just that kind of nose for the net, whereas Raymond is more of a playmaker. And so... I mean, like we were saying earlier, if the Ducks land at five or six, they're getting a really good player. Yeah, they're getting that's a guy the who's, who's going to make them better. But obviously, if you have the number one pick, uh, that's always yeah, it's always number, nice. Number one gets you a franchise-altering player. Yeah. Five or six gets you the potential 
of that, but it gets you. I think at worst you get a first or second line talent out of it. Alexi Lafreniere would make the Ducks so much better. It's hey. actually kind of crazy to think about. <laughs> yeah. Have you changed your opinion that you don't want to see him on the Ducks? Uh, when did, when have I said that? You did say that. Man, that when when did I say this? On the podcast. Was this on a Patreon podcast or a regular show? I'm pretty sure it was a regular show. I think you put it out there for the world to hear. Okay, well. Would you like I mean, to retract your statement? I wouldn't mind him being on the Ducks because I, I could watch him all the time. There you and go. That would, that would be a good experience. Statement that, that would retracted. Be a good time. Sure, call it, a, call it a retraction. Um, Do you want to finish out the, the next couple of picks or are we, are we done here? I think after that's Anaheim? it for that elite group. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I also just don't really care who New Jersey and Buffalo get because they're going to find a way to screw it up anyway. Uh, oh, oh you meant those drafted. people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, do we have any questions? Do you want to? Uh, you want to no, jump into that? Uh, it's just been a lot of our Twitch chat kind of being happy to talk with everyone again is kind of how the <laughs> Twitch chat has kind of. I love been. when the I love when the Twitch chat is just people mingling with each other. Hey, we've created a community here. You know. There's something to be said for that. But, There's something to be said for that. Um, one thing of note that I think is interesting, maybe this guy falls a little, and that would be kind of cool if the Ducks take him at 31, is Brendan Gooley's brother is Kaden in this. Gooley. Kaden Gooley is in this draft and is considered to be a first rounder. So um, he's more considered a he, middle he first rounder. To, he would have to fall quite a bit for yeah. them oh. for them to get him at 31. George asked, do you think the NHL will do the same virtual draft as the NFL as we kind of said at the beginning of the show? You and they, I they both, have to. <laughs> you and I both would like for it to happen. I think it's going to happen. I, I think the fact that you have TV companies in Sportsnet and probably NBC um, pushing them to do it, I think it's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, the Ducks could get a really good player at 31 as well, kind of like how we saw in the 2019 draft where they got Braden Tracy at yeah. 23. Um could happen again that they get a good player there. Um, there are guys who are in this first round that could definitely fall, just depending how teams prioritize need over best player available. One guy that I could maybe see falling, Lucas Reichel, who is the line mate for, for Tim Stutzle. So even if they don't get him, uh, they could get his line mate for Team Germany and could get a pretty, pretty solid sniper um, for years to come. So yeah, there's this is gonna be a fun draft. I'm I'm really yeah. excited. This is the most excited I've been for a draft in a long time. Um, just the depth of the class up top, and there's a lot of intriguing names even in the in the following rounds. So stay tuned for that. Um, I think the NHL is gonna have that early June draft, and we're all gonna be better for it. Yep. So I think that's probably gonna do it though for us on the night. So if you want to help support the show, uh. First way you can do it that's completely free to you if you have Amazon Prime is by becoming a Twitch subscriber. If you have Amazon Prime, you get one free Twitch Prime sub each and every month. You do have to hit that subscribe button after 30 days um, and every 30 days to help support the show. And it does help out more than you can imagine. I do want to give a shout out to the fact that we had uh, Bonnie resubscribe for 19 months in a row and George had resubscribed for 14 months. So thank you to Bonnie nice. and George for helping us out. They've been longtime listeners, good friends of the pod. And so I want to give him a big shout out for being here uh, with us. And both Bonnie and Varluna also cheered us on the show. So thank you so much. Um, so that's one way. The other way is YouTube. And we actually now have the uh, hyperlink uh, for the show. That's not random things. If you go to youtube.com slash C slash crash the pond, you will find our YouTube channel. That is official as of tonight. So that there has been is. set up. And so how else can you find us? Yeah, and um, we have still been going strong with the Patreon page, patreon.com slash crash the pond. For a dollar a month, a uh, dollar pledge a month, you get access to our patrons only chat, which is on Discord. And then for $5 a month, you get two bonus episodes, which are a lot of fun. Uh, we go in depth into different topics. Um, so like the draft, uh, NHL overall, we did an NHL awards podcast, um, some rewatchables. So they're just a lot of fun. And that's, again, at patreon.com slash crash the pond. Also, uh, I do want to say we did it a couple weeks ago, and there may be another one coming up at some point. We haven't really said it. But <laughs> um, uh, we did a watch-along stream of the comeback on Catella a couple weeks which, ago on our Which Twitch. was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was on our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash crash the pond. 
Um, keep an eye out for us when we tweet it out. We'll give you about a day or two's notice before we, we're going to go ahead and do it. And we'll find a game that can be uh, readily available, whether that be on NHL TV, YouTube, something like that. And uh, with that, all of us can set it up, start watching at the same exact time, and just hang out and watch a game together. And Felix and I will be chatting. You guys can be in the Twitch chat. It was a really good time. There may be there may be drinks involved. Maybe. maybe. There may be drinks involved. Yeah, the day after that watch along was a bit rough. So I was fine. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I was all right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you, you did what you do. What did I do? You did what you do. Um, okay. Moving on here. Uh, I had some Pedialyte after <laughs> check out Jake on Twitter at reindeer games. 91. I am on Twitter at Felix underscore Sicard and check out the site crash the pond.com. You know, it's been tough in the last few weeks because there's not a lot going on, but Hey, We'll bounce back, back in the saddle sooner rather than later. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you're well. Hope you're safe. And we will talk to you at the next show. Bye.